Good morning. Hello, and welcome to today's Saturday morning lecture, the third of five live streamed events this spring. My name is Dr. Sarah Johnson, and I will moderate today's session. Because of COVID, our public lecture series has had to move online. Today, we welcome Dr. Juna Crone to teach us about the science of heavy black holes and light subatomic particles. In the live stream description, you will find links to learn more about our speaker's career and accomplishments. Your questions for the speaker may be submitted via the chat box in YouTube. And now we're ready to begin. So welcome, Dr. Crone. Um, hi there, and thank you for having me. Let me just share my screen. All right, yeah, thanks for tuning in. Uh, I'm very excited to talk to you today about heavy black holes and light subatomic particles and uh, how that relates to my research. Um, so I should first sort of wind back a little bit and tell you uh, about what I do. And that is particle physics. I am a subatomic particle physicist. And what I think about all day is um, the fundamental building blocks of nature, the most elementary constituents, the elementary particles, and what they might be, and how we might find out that they are that. So experimentally, we have a few different ways at our disposal that we can study those. And the first one of those is probably something that comes to mind pretty easily, pretty quickly. Um, and that is, we can create them just by smashing together with a lot of energy, the other um, fundamental building blocks of nature that we already know about. And these collisions release so much energy that you can create new particles. And so that happens at a particle accelerator and a particle collider. And one of the most famous ones is uh, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN in Geneva. And this is one of the detectors, the ATLAS detector of that experiment. So this is a really an important way to study elementary particles, and we call it the high energy frontier. Another way that you could do this is you could actually measure like very precisely the properties of the particles that you already know about in a very precise uh, and sensitive experiment. And so if there are new particles, then something might be a little bit off, a little bit different about these properties of known particles. And um, this was, is what we often call um, the precision frontier. Then what you could do is you could build a very, very sensitive experiment and you could build that in an environment that is uh, shielded from other kind of interference uh, interactions. Um, and then you could wait and see if like particles um, such as dark matter particles fly through and give the signal in your detector. So this is one example at Snow Lab in Ontario of such an uh, experiment. And then another thing, and my, what I am uh, myself really, really curious and interested about is you could study uh, the cosmos. You could uh, turn your gaze to the stars. You could um, look for abnormalities in uh, astrophysics and cosmology and hints that uh, some sort of exotic particle physics may be at work. So there's many ways in which you could do that, the latter. It is the topic of this talk. Uh, I am going to focus on one particular way that this might be interesting and one opportunity for particle physics. And that has to do with stars. So stars are actually really interesting for particle physics because they become very, very hot. The star we uh, know best, of course, is the sun. And this is an example of like the, uh, the cross, a cross section of the star of the sun with different temperatures. And you see it gets really, really hot in the sun. So um, Kelvin is maybe not a unit you're super familiar with, but at these temperatures, it is more or less the same as Celsius. So 16 million de degrees. So why is that important for particle physics? Well, I mean, you might remember that uh, temperature tells you something about the kinetic energy that particles have in stars. So if the temperature is very high, Particles have a lot of energy and they just bounce around in the star and they also might collide with each other in the same way that they could do in a particle collider experiment. And so these collisions of particles with high energy can create other particles. And that is something that we might wanna study. Now, if you wanna become a little bit more quantitative about that, you can actually work out what the masses are of the particles that you can create with a given temperature. 
And so if you do that for the sun, for example, if you do this quick calculation, you find that you can create particles up to a mass of 1.4 keV, kilo electron volts. So if that's not really a mass that you sort of are super familiar with, we're going to get back to putting that in perspective uh, in a second. But first, I wanted to give you another perspective, and that is how um, other stars might relate to the sun and uh, what the opportunities are. So I promise you there's not too many complicated plots in this, um, in this talk, but one sort of uh, plot that you have to keep in mind uh, throughout a bit, and I'm going to show you throughout, is a plot where I have temperature of the object, temperature on the y-axis, and density of the object on the x-axis, because that turns out to be very important for particle physics. Now, these are very hot temperatures, and I told you the sun is very hot, but if I put them in my uh, graph that I've made here, it is all the way in the uh, lower left corner, meaning, of course, that if I'm going to fill this up, I'm going to talk about things that are even hotter and even denser than our sun. So stars like our sun evolve, and uh, in particular, they, they go through different stages of their lifetime. And so here, here's a few stages that stars like our sun uh, might encounter at some point. And so, you know, when they evolve, they start to burn, they burn uh, stuff up and they evolve slowly and but surely to hotter temperatures and denser temperatures until at some point they, they reach this tip of the red giant bra branch. And um, this is at the, in one of the final stages of their evolution. The very last stage of their evolution is when it's sort of, uh, when the star collapses and becomes a white dwarf. So white dwarfs are still pretty hot, but they don't generate any energy anymore. And so they slowly cool down and they are very dense. Now, much uh, bigger stars than our sun evolve a little bit differently towards the end. And what they do is they actually evolve much longer uh, for, uh, throughout, like uh, hotter and hotter and denser um, you know, regions of this plane. So this is like evolution after the stars have left what is called the main sequence to so the final stages of their evolutions, they become the hottest and the densest. Now, some stars might actually become neutron stars at the very end in a big explosion, which is very hot and very dense. And so you form this object which has this extreme density and is also very hot at the beginning, but then quickly cools down. Now, I talked about um, how you know, high temperatures relate to energies that you can use to create particles. And so I can actually directly translate between this picture of temperature in Celsius, degrees Kel uh, Kelvin, sorry, um, to particle masses in units of KeV. And so, as I was saying, stellar cores are like subatomic particle labs, and the temperature of the stellar core relates to what particles I can start to create. Now, let's put that in a little bit of perspective. How heavy are these particles actually? So, as particle physicists, there are uh, a bunch of particles that we are very, very certain of that they exist. We've um, made them, created them here on Earth, and we've measured lots of things about them. And we know that these are these fundamental building blocks of nature exist at the very least. So we call that collection of particles the standard model, the standard model of particle physics. And I've collected these the particles that are part of the standard model in this uh, plot here. And you see here on the uh, you know, top corner of, these, of each of these particles, you see a mass, just like you might, for example, see that in a periodic uh, table of elements. Now, Stars, as you saw in the previous slide, could create particles in their cores of up to 10 to hundreds of MeV. But now, I've, you know, I've just sort of uh, looked at the standard model for you, and that means that about half of the particles of the standard model are too heavy to be created in stars. So you might wonder, um, so we, we do know that these particles exist, and we have created them on Earth. Um, now, why do we need stars if we can actually already do a lot better on Earth? Um, so that'd be a really good question. And the answer lies uh, in a bit of a subtlety here. 
um, as particle physicists, we are not just interested in masses of particles. We are also interested in the strength of interactions that particles have with other particles. So basically, how likely it is that like they can bounce uh, into other particles, and you know something might happen. And so uh, we often draw this type of graph of like particle mass and interaction strength, and we can place all the particles that we know about somewhere on this this graph. Now. On Earth, as you might imagine, it is easier to produce things that interact strongly and that are relatively light so that you don't need as much energy to create them. And the particles of the standard model fall into that category that you can produce them on Earth. Now, um, some uh, particles might be as light as the particles of the standard model or lighter, but they interact so weakly, it is actually very hard to create them in a particle physics experiment or they might interact uh, as strongly, but they're too heavy to be created. You just need too much concentrated energy. Stars come in for the former of these particles. They create uh, lighter particles, but they can also be used to look into particles that are so weakly interacting, they're very hard to produce on Earth. Okay, so that's not the end of the story. Because we also wanted to sort of uh, think about ways that we could actually study the stars, because you have a lot of control, of course, in an experiment on Earth, and in the star, things just happen, and you can't just create a particular scenario. You have to look at what happens to the star to study uh, particle physics. And so um, a lot of what happens to a star depends on the mass of the star. And so the, the sun is the one that we know quite well. It's actually a fairly light star as it goes, you know, if you compare it to other stars. And so what will happen eventually to the sun is that, as I was saying, it will become at the very end of the day, a white dwarf. But heavier stars than the sun might have, suffer like a, a very different fate. And in particular, the very heaviest stars that are actually, you know, 25 solar masses, so at least 25 times the mass of the sun or heavier, they eventually you know, become super giants and there's this supernova explosion. And at the end of the day, they become black holes. Now, black holes is what we are interested in. Why? Because black holes, uh, you can probe them using gravitational waves. And we are starting to get a really good idea of what types of black holes are out there. And so we can use that to study the, the, the heaviest stars. How do we know what black holes are out there? Well, since a few years, we have be, become very good at measuring gravitational waves. So if you have not one black hole, but two black holes, they can form a binary and they rotate each other. And they rotate each other for a long time and eventually they merge. And when that happens, a big gravitational wave signal gets sent out. And that is something we can detect on Earth. So the LIGO and the Virgo collaboration they do these experiments that measure gravitational waves. And through gravitational waves, they have already measured 50, more than 50 of such binary black hole mergers. This led to the Nobel Prize in physics because this is really new information about black holes. And so because this is actually already quite a large collection of events, we actually start to know already what the black hole population is like, what, what black holes we have, what types of black holes we have and where they, they are. So this is kind of all of that, the collection of that information that is now kind of available after LIGO and Virgo have run their experiments for a few years. We call it the stellar graveyard because as you remember, like black holes are the final stages of um, a star's lifetime. And so here, uh, this, this collection is kind of organized by mass in units of the mass of the sun. So here, 20 means 20 times the mass of the sun. So you see neutron stars are a little bit lighter. Black holes can be super heavy. OK, but now we actually start to learn a bit about like what types of black holes are out there and what their masses are. And there actually is a bit of, sort of organization in this type of collection, we think. First of all, there is a gap between the mass of the heaviest neutron star and the mass of the lightest black hole. That's interesting uh, as well. But what I'm interested in today is this heavy mass gap. So we think that there might also be a gap 
in the spectrum of black hole masses, meaning that like um, you can produce black holes up to a certain mass, and then you can't produce them for a while until you can produce them again. So how does that work? So that's what I'm going to talk about. So to study that, um, we need to zoom in into this plane. We need to look at the post-main sequence evolution, the late evolution of these heaviest stars, which happens here in this plane. And that's what I'm going to do. And the way that we can study that is by, whoops, by uh, doing a simulation of these stars. And here's the zoomed in plane, temperature and density again. And what I'm showing you is the evolution of three different stars with initial masses as I start them off evolving of 14 times the mass of the sun, 17, uh, 17 times the mass of the sun, and 120 times the mass of the sun. So what happens first? So in these late stages of the evolution, the star is, you should uh, imagine the kind of a, a big ball of like uh, stuff, and the ball has a lot of gravity. So what gravity wants to do is like pull the stuff in the star in. But there is, are also these nuclear reactions and nuclear re uh, reactions release energy and that sort of presses back against, it, against gravity and so keeps it from collect, collapsing. So what nuclear reactions are most important depends on the temperature. And so this first stage that is important is where the star is, as we say, burning helium. So it is converting helium via beryllium, it's converting helium into carbon and energy. So I'm trading helium in the star for carbon and energy. And what I might also do is trade this carbon again, take a carbon in another helium and produce an oxygen and energy. Later on, at some point I just run out of helium. And later on when that happens, the star collapses for a little bit, but then it's at some point becomes so hot that it can start to kick off these nuclear reactions with carbon. And carbon might, uh, two carbon atoms might uh, form other, uh, other um, elements and energy. And that's what happen happens later on. Now, that is not the end of the story. That is just normal stellar evolution as you might expect it. What makes this really interesting is something I haven't told you about this plane. It's something I haven't told you about this plot. And that is that there is actually a danger zone in this plot. And that sits over here. So what happens in this danger zone? What happens to stars that get close to this danger zone or maybe enter it? Now, so as I told you, like the temperature in a stellar core means that you know, particles interact and, and bounce off each other and can produce other particles. Um, some of the particles that we know that can be created are electrons and their antiparticles, positrons. So it can have this type of reaction where two gamma, two photon particles, you know, uh, come together and produce an electron and a positron pair. So I start off with two photons and I end up with a, like, an electron and a positron. Now, that is a danger thing because as I was mentioning, what actually uh, gives the star outward pressure and keeps it from collapsing upon itself is the, is the photons. So the, you, I'm taking something um, that actually supplies this pressure, and I'm, sub I'm, I'm trading it off for something, electrons and positrons, that don't give me the pressure, but do give me extra pressure, uh, extra gravity. So what happens, you might guess, at extra gravity and uh, less pressure, the star starts to collapse in this danger zone. Now, why do I care about that? What happens then? So what happens then is, a lot to do with um, some of the stuff that is in the star at the moment that you start to collapse. And what is in the star no longer have helium, have carbon, and I have oxygen, and oxygen is the key. Because oxygen, when the star starts to collapse and becomes very hot and dense, oxygen starts to uh, back react, and there's this kind of explosion of oxygen burning reactions, releasing a lot, a lot of energy. So what happens? So the first stages I, I told you about, like I have this star, it's evolved, I'm producing uh, electron positron pairs, and I enter this danger zone and I collapse. That collapse then ignites oxygen, and then one of three things might happen, and what happens depends on the mass of the star. So very, very, very heavy stars, 
So round about say 200 times the mass of the sun, like very heavy stars, they actually shortcut this the whole thing entirely. Uh, and there's this other instability that happens and you directly form a black hole. But the stars that I'm mostly interested in, um, very, very heavy stars, they might, this, this process where like this explosion of oxygen might be so violent that all of the stuff of the star is just sort of like, uh, you know, flies into the universe and nothing is like in the star anymore. And I end up with nothing at all. I traded a star for nothing at all. Slightly lighter stars. What could happen is this process is violent and actually lots of stars is ejected into the, the universe. But I still have a, a bit of stuff left and that stuff then might cool and it might go through this process again. And I shed mass again and I eject another bit of mass eventually cooling so much that um, you know, everything sort of starts to behave as normal anymore. I uh, again, I don't enter this danger zone anymore and eventually I collapse into a black hole. But the black hole that I end up with is a lot lighter than I would have thought originally because of this uh, pulsation where I'm ejecting mass into the universe. Okay, so if I do this in a simulation and I come in with like uh, a bunch of different initial masses and I just do this around the simulation and I figure out what the final black hole mass is, then I get something like this type of plot. So what you can see is that here on the left hand side, you know, there is, there are processes that are less kind of violent in which I lose mass. Uh, that's a little bit less important, but everything kind of scales the way I expect it to. So these things, here on the left hand side of the plot, do not enter the danger zone and everything kind of behaves as normal and the black holes that I produce um, are kind of what I would have expected them to be based on kind of normal astrophysical processes. But then here towards the right of the plot, you see that that is no longer true. And this pulsation, um, this ejecting mass into the universe means that the final black holes that I end up with um, are lighter than I would have expected them to be. And they actually become lighter and lighter and lighter for heavier and heavier in input stars. And eventually I don't end up with anything at all. And that is what happens here. And if I continue this plot to the right, you still end up with nothing at all for like a very large range of uh, initial masses. Now, another thing that then is a direct consequence of this is that there is a maximum mass of a black hole that you can form. So that's kind of this line here. If I draw this line to the y-axis, I see that I actually have no black holes for this whole range, for this whole upper part of the plot. And that is why we think there is a mass gap. So that means that like when I actually study gravitation waves and I study the black holes that I can um, see, I can detect through gravitation waves, I expect them to have these masses but not these masses. Okay, so that's a consequence of electrons as a subatomic atomic particle that I'm interested in, but it's not the only one. Electrons is already one that we know about. I wanna know like, what can we learn about new particles using this process? And it turns out that new physics, new particles can influence this, this process because it's kind of a sensitive balance of things that are happening. And if I just you know, change something slightly, this can be just lead to completely different prediction of black hole masses. So what are, what are things that I might think about? Well, um, you know, a few things might happen when I produce a new particle in the star. So one thing that might happen is I produce them, but I produce them with a very large velocity and they don't actually interact much with the stuff in the star and they just sort of get kicked out immediately. They free stream out, as we say. So the star loses energy in that way, and they, these, these particles just fly off into the unknown. Another thing that might happen is I produce them in the star, but they actually are either quite heavy and, and they don't have a large velocity when I produce them, um, or they, they sort of kick around in the star because they interact with other stuff, and so they're trapped. So that just means that the star will actually behave a little bit differently because now there's this extra stuff around that changes how things, things work in the star. Um, what might happen as well is that the star is like a, you know, a big sort of gravitational object. It might attract other things 
And uh, what might also happen is that like, you know, either stuff was already there or stuff is like uh, attracted by the star. Either way, alternative stuff isn't created in the star, but, you know, collects into the stellar core. And that also means that the star will evolve differently. Um, then a last thing that could happen is new particles, um, you know, might not kind of directly have an effect, but may, may modify the rates of production of other particles in the star in such a way that, you know, stuff is very different. Um, so this might then mean that uh, either like the star cools quicker or um, the star's uh, internal dynamics is different. It might do a, a host of different things. Um, so I've written a, a, a few uh, papers about this. Some of my collaborators uh, have as well. Um, you know, if you're super interested, I collected them here at the bottom. I will now want to talk about a little bit these first two to focus on today uh, and see what happens to, to the whole process of like stellar evolution and final black hole formation. Right. So. Um, let's start with the one where I produce new particles and they just fly out of the star. So what, what that means is that the star loses energy during this process and uh, it affects how it evolves. And so how does it affect how it evolves? That's something we really had to fight, figure out. Like I can predict this before we did this simulation. And I'm showing you here uh, the result of the, such a simulation. So this is a little bit hard to read this, this, this evolution plot, but I'm gonna guide you through it. So you should imagine that all of these stars, I'm starting off with three stars that have the same mass. And so they're uh, about the same starting off. So they start off with a mass of like over 60 solar masses, over 60 times the mass of the sun. And everything is the same about these stars, except some of them have new particles that are produced in the core and some do not. And so there is this here, this kind of parameter that I can use to measure how many new particles are produced. The gray line is where no new particles are produced. The orange line is where a few new particles are produced. And the green line is where more uh, new particles are produced. So I start off here in this plane at a particular temperature and a particular mass. Now, you see all of, this, all of the stuff here is kind of close together. So I have magnified it for you a little bit. So I'm starting off here. This is here this kind of a, uh, uh, zooming in on the bit that's here. So these stars are the same as they start off. But then immediately I see, you know, they start to lose a bit of mass due to stellar winds, a normal astrophysical process, which is like, you know, uh, the stars just shed a bit of their outer layer into the universe, not a whole lot. There's already a little bit of a difference here. You see the, the, um, the wind loss, the amount of mass that the star is losing, in the case with no extra particles, it's a bit more than in the other cases. But the real difference comes in for pulsation losses. So the uh, pulsations that come from the danger zone are just a lot more intense, a lot uh, more extreme in the case with no extra particles than in the case with extra particles. Huh? So what is happening? Extra particles, so extra ways of losing energy, mean that the star loses much, much less mass in these pulsations later on. So you see here, this, this, this standard case is, uh, you know, over 20 times the mass of the sun is lost in these pulsations. And in these other cases, far less, maybe about five uh, times the mass of the star. Why is that? Well, so it turns out that uh, these new ways that the stars can lose uh, energy during, uh, during the, the, the burning of um, helium means that the burning of helium just goes a lot faster because the star is losing energy now. It has to work a lot harder to, um, to, to burn through its, its nuclear supply and to produce other stuff and to produce energy to keep it from collapsing. And so here is this parameter again. This parameter measures how many new particles I'm producing. And so if I dial this up here, if I go to the right in this plot, I'm producing more new particles. I see that the time scale that it takes to burn through my helium supply is a lot le less. And that then has a direct implication for how much carbon is produced in helium burning and how much oxygen uh, has, is produced. I.e., 
I have lots of new particles that are produced. That means the star is producing less oxygen. And less oxygen, as I mentioned, leads to less violent ex explosions because oxygen is the thing that is exploding. So if I do the simulation, what I find is that um, you know, the more, particle, the more uh, new particles are produced in the core of the star, the heavier the black holes are that I can produce because the less extreme this process in which I shed eject a lot of the mass from the star. And so as a result, the gap of masses in which I can't produce black holes shifts upwards if I have, have these new particles. Okay, so that's one of the, the cases, one of the types of scenarios of new particles that you might think about. And we see here that it actually already implies a pretty big shift, a pretty big uh, prediction on the black holes that we have around us in our universe. But there's other ways that you might think about. And uh, one example, uh, one of the other examples was, what if these particles that are produced in the course of these stars don't fly out? but actually remain in the star and they are trapped. Now then other things might happen. And one of the very interesting things that could happen is that instead of electron and positron pairs that are produced that trigger the collapse, which then eventually means the explosion will happen, these new particles could do the same thing. So here is an example of a new particle, which we call A prime. And so I could just, draw like what the danger region looks like for this type of new particle, depending on its mass. And so that might shift a little bit around. And it just means that there is this new kind of danger region that would happen. So if you have a particle that is um, say hundred kV, so it's lighter than, the, than an electron, it means that another danger region may, may, may be uh, created in this plot such that stars would encounter that earlier and actually uh, go through this process where the star collapses and then uh, oxygen, if it is already there in the star, ignites and like explodes uh, the star. Cool. Okay, so now we know that new particles might affect the late stages of stellar evolution in such a way that it actually has a, a big consequence for the black holes that we end up at the end of the day. Now, how can we actually test that prediction? So to do that, we can look at the data that we have about black holes. And this data comes from the LIGO and Virgo collaboration, the first few observation runs that have been concluded and the collection of black holes. I showed you that in another way before, uh, but here is it again, the collection of black hole masses that they have observed. So if I just take this information uh, again, and I kind of draw a histogram of the uh, black hole masses that occur, then it looks something like this. So you might think, okay, this looks suggestive or not, um, you know, to, to actually see what, what is happening here and what we learned from it, we have to do a bit of processing and we have to think about what we expect to happen. Okay, right. So what we do is what we predict Given a scenario about particle physics, given a particle physics scenario, we predict black hole masses originating from stellar masses. So we can draw this curve. This curve tells us what black hole mass I expect given an initial stellar mass. And it looked a little bit like this, if you remember. Now, um, if we imagine a different scenario with different particles being produced in the stellar core, that might change. Um, in such a way that like, you know, you just predict at the very, at the, at the, for these uh, lighter stellar stars, you still kind of predict the same black holes because these are not the stars that enter the danger region, but the stars that enter the danger, danger region might behave differently than you expected at first because of new particles. And so this, this uh, curve will look different. Now, how can we test that? And how can we test, for example, where this turnover is and where this like, masses where you don't actually get any black holes anymore. So one thing that you might use is that you could see here um, that you know, for a range of different stellar masses, this is kind of pretty large range here of different stellar masses, but the range that, that you would predict of black hole masses is actually very small. So what that means is that 
uh, there is quite a lot of black holes produced of this very small range of masses. And so if I think about the black holes that I would have, that means that there's this kind of peak here in the spectrum, after which there is a fall off because these black hole masses correspond to these black hole masses, and I actually don't have any black holes at all anymore. Um, I should say this is from black holes that are formed through astrophysics, through the death of stars. But then there is other black holes, other ways of forming black holes, um, which might contribute another type of spectrum, which I've drawn here. So you can allow for different types of black hole populations formed in different ways. But the most important feature here is this type of peak and this sort of, sort of fall off uh, that you would uh, observe in the spectrum of black hole masses of LIGO and Virgo. And so I can actually take different uh, scenarios. Um, you know, I can just take my, um, I, can, I can take the uh, simulations that I've done to actually do this type of, um, you know, to, to create this type of plot of initial star mass versus final black hole mass and what I predict in the case of the standard model. So no new particles. And then I can sort of calculate what, uh, type of black hole distribution, what types of black hole distribution, how many black holes of a certain kind I would see uh, observed by a gravitational waves. And that is what this is. And you see indeed there's this peak here. Now in my scenario with new particles, this thing might look very different. And that will also correspond to a very different, um, a very different distribution of black holes in the universe and a very different distribution of black holes that we could observe through mergers and gravitational waves. So, um, you know, this is something that like at the moment we're, uh, we're, 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 we're doing. Um, currently, LIGO and Virgo have uh, collected data on um, a number of, uh, a number of uh, events, over 50 already, which sounds like a lot. But really, to do accurate statistical analysis, uh, you need a lot more. But luckily, we are going to get a lot, lot more because this is only going to grow. This, you know, more, more uh, gravitational wave experiments are going to be uh, constructed, and the sensitivity will go up, meaning that we'll le learn so much more about black hole populations in the in the next few years. And then we can actually test this type of thing, and then uh, figure out which one of these scenarios is the truth. So do we have uh, no new particles that behave in this certain way? Or do we have new particles in sort of, uh, that behave in this sort of way? Such that the black holes that I actually expect to observe to, uh, in these uh, binary merger events is, is very different. So time will tell. And time will actually tell us uh, what this type of uh, distribution of black holes looks, uh, looks like. And then we can use that to learn about new particles. So that already brings me, um, you know, to the towards the end of what I wanted to talk to you about. So um, I argued that you know you could, you could study particle physics through astrophysics, and one good example of that is uh, studying particle physics in the course of stars, because the course of stars become very very hot and so hot that I can create new particles. Now. It's important, especially because gravitational waves now are a new way that we can look at the universe and we can do things that we couldn't do otherwise. And one of the things that we could do is um, map out populations of black holes. So actually learn what types of black holes are out there around us in our galaxy and in other galaxies. And doing that will tell us uh, something about how these black holes were formed. And the formation of black holes is interesting because there is this kind of extreme process that might happen. The um, pair instability might lead to a big explosion, meaning that I actually can't form black holes. And so the populations of black holes will tell, tell me whether or not uh, you know, that, that is happening and that is important and how new physics might affect that. So black hole populations themselves will tell us about new particle physics through the existence of this black hole mass gap, which might shift due to the effects of particle physics. And the late stages of stellar evolution will tell us a little bit more also about um, you know, the ex exact kind of distribution of black holes that we will see, even besides the mass gap itself. And this is something that we'll learn about a 
spot in the next few years. Um, so with that, uh, I would like to thank you. Uh, I would also like to thank my wonderful collaborators uh, throughout this time that you know we uh, were the first to look into this last year and we are still studying this um, every day and it's been a really exciting journey and they've been just a dream to work with. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank you and you can ask me anything you like. Um, and uh, you can also just approach me you know, via my email address or via my website. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Juno. That was that was fascinating. I had no idea that that um, you had oxygen explosions like this, you know, that were mixed up in the uh, formation of black holes. So mm -hmm. we have a few questions here. Um, I'll start with the the question from uh, the YouTube chat, and just to encourage everybody who's watching to please go ahead and post all your questions uh, in the chat. So. Um, so this is a question from an, about an earlier slide um, mm -hmm. where someone was asking, so from the population slide, it's really not clear where the gap is. Mm -hmm. If possible, can you explain that in a bit more detail? So that was yeah. from an earlier part. So I know you mm -hmm. talked more about it, but. Right, right. So I mean, okay, let me just, so went back a little bit. So in the very beginning, I showed, uh, this plot right and um yeah let me explain this a little bit more and I, I agree that like this gap is probably a little bit more obvious than the uh, hypothetical gap which we don't know the exact location of that would be up here but so one thing that's important to remember is that um what you're show seeing here in this plot is like two stars that merge to form uh, sorry two black holes that merge to form a heavier black hole and so the really the important thing is these original black holes, because these are the ones that are formed through the death of stars. The, the black hole at the end of the merger is of course much heavier because it's um, these two black holes together have a, have a mass which is much heavier. And so the product of this merger is actually not super important here. What I'm, what I'm um, thinking about especially is these original, original black holes. And so it's actually a shame that it doesn't have another color here. Maybe I should do that because that would, you know, make it a little bit more obvious. But these are the ones that I worry about. Now, later on in the talk, I showed this um, same sort of thing again, but then without the, um, without the final black hole mass. And that's this. So there's also kind of experimental error bars here. This is just kind of uncertainty that, that there is. Uh, just uh, because of the nature of the measurement, there's an uncertainty, you know, so that the actual black hole mass can vary in a certain range. So the real power lies in statistical analysis of this whole collection and the, and the further collections of black holes that, um, you know, will become visible over the next few years. But I can already, already take these masses of these um, progenitor black holes, the black holes that have not merged yet, um, and, and sort of draw a histogram of these masses and that is what this is so um i agree that it's not necessarily that obvious yet where the mass gap starts especially because you know there is other things you know the other ways that you could create heavy black holes um they don't necessarily all have to be uh, directly the final stage of uh, states of uh, stars they might have merged earlier and so the real power will lie in you know statistical analysis uh, figuring out exactly, you know, how you expect this to go with this kind of peak in the in the in the um, in the sort of distribution of masses, uh, which is characteristic of this type of event, and then you can um, start to unravel where exactly the the black hole mass gap would begin. That makes lots of sense. So especially about the fact that we shouldn't worry about the the ones after the merger, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so I, one question I had is I wondered if you could talk a little bit about what these new particles would be, what we, if we have any idea what they're gonna be or what they are. Yeah, yeah, good, good question. So um, yeah, I mean, we are not, of course, we're not necessarily just randomly thinking about new particles. Some particles have a particular motivation because we are thinking about particles that actually answer bigger questions that we have about the universe. So one of these questions, for example, is what is dark matter? Um, another question is, 
uh, how did we end up with so much matter and so little antimatter? So these are all kind of big questions. They're unresolved. They don't have an answer yet, but there are proposed answers. And these proposed answers often also come with predicted new particles. And so the particles that we are most interested in are uh, particles that are predicted in these answers to big questions. Now, of course, what, I, what we would like to do is be as general as, as possible. So we've, we've tried to come up with a language that is uh, fairly general and that uh, we can use one, so that we can use one type of language to study different types of particles and capture as much in our analysis as, as possible. But it still means that the scenarios are slightly different. So for example, uh, this scenario, this new particle scenario that I've taken here, um, is for a particular uh, particle called a hidden photon, which uh, pops up in a lot of different theories. But you know, the, the predictions are here slightly different than if I would have taken an, another part new particle, uh, just because you know, particles have particular uh, interactions that are important, interacts and in, in, you know, different things happen when they bounce around in the star. And so uh, we are looking for, for uh, particles that are well motivated and study what happens. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. So, um, all right, so we have a few more questions here. Um, one question was um, whether uh, we could just measure the amount of oxygen and carbon expelled in the explosion of a supernova, and could we learn something from that? Oh, that's a really good question, yeah. So, yeah, good, very, very good question. Uh, let me think about how to answer that. So. Um, indeed, you know, we can also, we, we, know, we know quite a bit about supernova explosions. Uh, however, um, you know, the ways that we have to look at supernova explosions are often to do with the light that reaches us from these supernova explosions, as well as, let me see where, uh, as well as um, the neutrinos that, uh, so there's different particles that come, come at us from the supernova. Uh, which we can measure in our detectors. Um, now, because of like, um, you know, if, if uh, a process like a supernova expels photons, then you can imagine that the further away you are from the supernova, the fewer photons you could expect to measure, just because the photons are just spread over a very large volume and you can only detect a, a small amount of that volume. So that means that if we want to look at supernova explosions, we have to be pretty lucky that it's kind of close to us. And so um, there's one supernova that happened in 1987, uh, just before, a few years before I was born, actually, which we are still learning from, because that one happened within our galaxy. So that happened relatively close to us. And so we could detect quite a, a few things about it, and we could uh, learn from it about particle physics, and we can still learn about that. Um, but if it happens, you know, much further away, then we are unlucky and uh, supernovas don't happen all the time. So we have to just be very lucky that something ha happens. Now, um, gravitational waves are interesting because uh, you could actually look a bit further with them because of how gravitational waves propagate and what we measure about gravitational waves. It means that you could actually look a bit further away um, than you could do um, with, with the photons from supernovas. And that's, so that means that like, um, you know, you, I can actually very quickly learn about uh, the amount of black holes that I have uh, out there. And then maybe I would have to wait and be quite lucky um, that supernovas happen close by. That's one part of the answer. The other part of the answer is that, um, so supernovae themselves are pretty rare. But uh, some of these supernovae that are important for me, for the, these heavier stars, they could have happened also uh, a long time in the past. So these are objects that these stars evolved a long time in the past. Uh, and then by now, they have already undergone a supernova explosion and they've already become a black hole. And now it's actually very rare to see these heavy stars um, in, out there in the universe. So that's even rarer, more rare. Right, so I guess gravitational waves um, happen a lot more often. So, so you're a, mm -hmm. you have a better chance of detecting them. Yeah, um, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So another question mm -hmm. actually was related to um, the image on the front slide. Um, mm -hmm. 
And we're just wondering if you could describe um, what that is on the title slide, the binary merger, and is that a photograph mm -hmm. or a visual simulation or how was it created? Oh yeah, good. No, that is actually, uh, that's a binary merger. It is not a photon <laughs> or a photo. It is like a, an artist impression as you would call it. Um, because uh, remember, like we observe these through gravitational waves and not through, through, uh, through photons. And photos are what we would use to take a photon photo. And so, um, but the way that it works, I don't know if we could easily get that slide up again, but if you Google, um, if you would just put in Google, like, you know, binary merger black holes, that's, that's the, the picture that you would see. Um, so what you, the way that you should sort of think about this is uh, it's a binary. So it's two black holes and black holes are objects that are, you know, so massive that they actually suck in all the light. So not even light can escape them. And that is why in the uh, image, they are dark. So this, this, this photo just gives you an impression of what it would look like if you could see it with photons. So we have another um, so somewhat related, um, that was a good explanation. So, um, so um, someone was wondering how you can figure out the masses of the black holes from the gravitational wave signal. Mm, good, yeah, very good question. Um, yeah, and that is actually pretty difficult. <laughs> and uh, what is actually, there is a combination of masses that it, you can easily figure out. And that is because um, the gravitational wave uh, gravitational wave has like a particular amplitude and a phase. They're just like waves as you, uh, as you may be imagining them. And so um, the amplitude of the gravitational wave signal relates to how big the objects were that created them. And so you could read off like exactly how the shape of this waveform goes. And you could figure out um, a few things. And one of the things is like, um, you know, how, how big these objects are or together that created the, the gravitational wave signal. Now, then you know something about these objects together to actually uh, get some more information about the individual components, because that is what we want to know, is harder. And what you need to do is like study the waveform in a lot more detail. You have to be a little bit lucky that you can do that because sometimes these gravitational wave sig signals, they're actually not very, uh, strong there, as we call them, we, they're quite silent. They're not very loud. <laughs> and so therefore, you know, it's not, it's not always the case that you can actually measure a lot more about this gravitational waveform. But when you can, you can actually um, sort of uh, break the degeneracy. You can, um, you can uh, look at both what these uh, masses are together and what these individual masses are. But because that's a lot harder, that's why you have these error bars here. So these, this, there's uncertainty uh, in that prediction. So I have another um, question related to black hole detection, which is what are, what are the other ways of, um, apart from supernovas that don't happen very often and gravitational waves, what are other ways of finding black holes? Of finding them or of creating them? <laughs> of finding them, like detecting okay. them. Detecting them, um, yeah. So there's a, there's a few other ways. They have often also to do with the fact that like that the black holes have a, a gravitational pull, so they pull stuff inwards. Um, so that may, means that um, you can study because the black hole itself you can't see because all the photons like you know go into the black hole and they don't leave. So the black hole itself you can't see. That's a challenge. But what you can see is stuff around the black hole going towards the black hole. Uh, so that's a good way of looking at it. And um, so from, from that type of uh, observation, we know uh, that there are supermassive black holes at the centers of galaxies, for example. And um, the recent picture of a black hole from the Event Horizon Telescope has a lot to do with that. So they, uh, the Event Horizon Telescope uh, looked at the center of our neighboring galaxy and took a picture um, of the black hole, but really of the stuff around it that is going to get sucked into the black hole. Um, then another thing that you, you, uh, you could do is like, uh, you know, if a black hole forms a binary, so it's like two uh, objects, one is a black hole and the other is another type of star, then these things rotate each other and you could just monitor the other star to figure out that there must be something else out there and that's the black hole. So it's, it's all kind of like studying black holes because we don't see photons we don't see these signals directly. 
um, we need to figure out clever ways to look at the stuff around black holes to know that there's a black hole. And I guess that's how we know there's that black hole in the center of our own galaxy. Yeah, yeah. It was the mm -hmm. subject of the most recent uh, physics Nobel Prize, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So another question um, was um, more about, um, so you're a theorist, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and how, how your work in theory supports um, the work that experimentalists, experimental physicists do? Yeah, good question. Yeah, so indeed I am a theorist. And, uh, but I am the type of theorist actually that is kind of like, um, you know, towards like experimental physics. So there's, there's colleagues of mine that study very theoretical things and, you know, uh, quantum gravity and, uh, and uh, things that are quite far away from being tested. I like to think about things that are uh, close to being detected. So that's why I'm very interested in this stuff, for example, because we actually have this data now and we can learn about stuff now or in the very you know, near future. And so uh, I work a lot with ex experimentalists. At the moment, I actually talk a lot with people that are inside this experimental collaboration, LIGO and Virgo. Uh, I am part of uh, a consortium that, like that is called LISA. So we are thinking about the um, sort of the follow-up experiments of LIGO and Virgo. So LIGO and Virgo is a gravitational wave experiment, a, an interferometer on Earth. My, but you might do the same thing in space. And so that's, of course, a bit harder to do and a bit more expensive, uh, but it's going to be done. And that is called LISA, that experiment. And I'm part of that consortium, for example. So um, because I'm kind of close to, um, you know, close to experimentalists and I think about things that can be detected pretty uh, in the near near future. I, I, you know, I interact a lot with with experimentalists. And uh, I would say like, you know, we study uh, our, our work neighbors each other and we that's a com complementary to each other. Um, so and then I talk, I kind of form the bridge between people that study, you know, very theoretical stuff and, and experimentalists, and we call that phenomenology. So and I had I had one last question was a, which was I was wondering how you got into this field in the first place when you first became interested in physics yourself mm. and um, like if there was something that inspired you or yeah that's a, that's that question has a long answer I have to warn you I'll try and keep it short um, I. <laughs> It took me a long time to figure out what I wanted to do. I was interested in a lot of different things. Um, in high school, I thought I would go to art school and study fine arts. Um, and I actually kind of got somewhere along that path and I did a lot of pre-art school uh, stuff. And, um, but then at the end of the day, I was also very curious about things. And I, uh, mathematics was always one of my... Um, yeah, when it like came pretty natural to me, it was like a language that I understood. And um, so at the end of the day, I, I went to study um, something like liberal arts and science. So I actually kind of made, uh, like try to not make a choice and to try to delay making a choice about what I wanted to do with my life until, you know, like much later. Um, so kind of honestly, to be honest, I just kind of rolled into it. I follow like things that interest me um, and, uh, you know, even though I didn't really see myself as a physicist until maybe, you know, only a few years ago during my PhD, I did really like physics. So, you know, in my undergrad, for example, I watched a lot of like online lectures like this one, you know, uh, courses like this one. I read a lot of blogs uh, and I was very curious about specific topics um, often to do with uh, how quantum physics works and uh, also about how the early universe works. And um, yeah, I just, um, I didn't always know that I wanted to become a scientist, but when I started to do science, I loved it and I still do. That's great, thank you so much. So I think that, that is, that's all the questions we have for you. So thank you so much for a wonderful lecture. And um, I know I learned a lot, so. <laughs> And I hope everybody else did too. So um, 
So, and I think that's, that's the end of our lecture for today. So thank you everybody for coming. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sarah. And uh, thanks everyone for joining.